So for those of you that are familiar with the program, the key elements of the, the program are essentially the same as the last time that we ran it. The program can support urban design initiatives and technology such as lighting and CCTV to help improve community safety and confidence in public places. The program has a focus on what we call environmental and situational crime prevention. Councils only are eligible to apply for funding and there's a cap of $250,000 per council. So that could be either for an individual project or across multiple projects. The reason we do that is because we want councils to prioritise applications within your own municipality. You know best what are the, the priorities. And we don't want councils to take like a scattergun approach and just put in a whole lot of applications that maybe don't have um, the level of thought that we'd like to see. The grant funds are for infrastructure only and projects should be completed by the 30th of April 2017. So once we factor in the approval process, you're looking at around an 18 month project from start to finish. That should also be a consideration in looking at the projects that you're putting forward uh, for consideration, those that you believe can be delivered within that time frame. There is a minimum co-contribution expected with the program. That is 20% of the total project cost for metropolitan uh, local government areas and 10% for rural regional areas. It's fairly modest compared to many of the other state government infrastructure programs that are there are around. Consideration will be given to half of this being uh, in-kind support. The co-contribution can also include funds towards non-infrastructure items, so consultation, project management, design, evaluation, a whole range of other costs, as well as contributing to the capital component. That co-contribution must exclude other state government funding and ongoing expenses as well. Now, the state, other state government funding, of course, is welcome, but just in terms of not being included as part of the, the co-contribution. So what won't be funded? We always ask that people review the guidelines carefully, um, and these are also set out on the, on the screen. I'm just going to touch on several of these. We won't fund projects that aren't community crime prevention focused. For instance, fire safety, water safety, occupational health and safety, road safety and traffic safety initiatives. We have had applications in the past for those areas and they won't be funded. It is clearly around uh, community crime prevention. We also, as I said, won't fund uh, non-infrastructure costs. Again, they can be part of your co-contribution, but they won't be funded through the program. While fixed CCTV systems can be funded, we will not fund mobile CCTV systems because of concerns around privacy and providing adequate notice um, with those sorts of systems. We also won't fund security infrastructure for buildings that don't exist at present. So if you're looking at building a new facility or a new community centre and want to include CCTV or lighting or other security infrastructure, we won't fund that if the, the, the facility isn't built yet because we've had problems in the past with things, obviously with capital projects being delayed for some time. we will come to what we can fund, which is, uh, that includes urban design improvements designed to deter crime and support mixed and legitimate use of public spaces. We know that crimes against people and property in public places are less likely to occur when, if other people are around. The direct presence of other people, especially lots of other people, created by activated spaces, both discourages offenders and increases people's sense of security, which then in turn encourages more use of that area. When we talk about improving casual or natural surveillance, this also refers to the indirect presence of people. So of designing spaces that can be seen by nearby residences or businesses, and, and that there's uh, improved sight lines uh, and the like. So initiatives that promote direct or indirect presence of people through activation or improving casual or natural surveillance are clearly within the scope of this program. <coughs> improving safe movements and connections is also important because people feel more comfortable 
using public spaces that provide well-defined routes and sight lines. Entrapment is also a strong predictor of perception of danger. So the program will support design initiatives, landscaping, and other works to remove entrapment points or blind spots. Now, lighting can be a very effective crime prevention tool, and people often feel safer in well-lit areas because they can see what and who is around them, and it can also increase activity. It also increases the risk of offenders being seen and therefore has a deterrent effect. But lighting is also highly site-specific, and it's not always appropriate and it can be counterproductive in some circumstances. Illuminating an asset in a non-populated area may draw attention to it and make it a target for crime. Lighting in an area not intended for nighttime use can also create a, a false sense of security for people. Lighting should also be at a height that prevents vandalism, and where lighting is at a lower level, vandal-proof fittings should be used. We've had examples, unfortunately, of some councils having projects with in-ground lights and they've subsequently been vandalised, and the councils have then had to uh, to replace those, put in protective fittings at their own expense. So there's some tips like in the safer design guidelines that we refer to around, around that. Again, in the safer design guidelines, white lighting is, is talked about in terms of removing um, distortion, improving colour rendition and facial recognition. And again, where people can more clearly see their surroundings, that improves the perception of safety. As I mentioned, I'd encourage people to view the Safer Design Guidelines on our website. We've also provided a link to a lighting prevention guide uh, from the West Australian Office of Crime Prevention. And that has, it's probably even more fulsome in terms of some tips and information around lighting, if that's what you're looking at. The guidelines also indicate that we're particularly encouraging projects that have an integrated mix of crime prevention activities. So a proposal for lighting alone that's not building on previous investment or part of an integrated response is less attractive to us than those that have a mix of elements. The program can also support physical security measures such as perimeter fencing, bollards, security window treatments, security doors, those types of things. These measures are often uh, referred to as situational crime prevention or target hardening because it increases the effort for an offender to uh, break into a property. Of course, we have our small grants, the Community Safety Fund, open at the moment until July the 10th. So for small individual projects, that's the funding stream to go through. The requirements are far more streamlined for that program. We have had councils in the past, though, apply for multiple projects within a PSIF application. Where you're looking at doing that, we do still expect that you provide information around each of those sites and address the criteria, so being clear around what you're actually funding where, you know, what is the need in those areas, uh, breaking down the budget, those sorts of things. Closed circuit television, CCTV, which is another area that we can continue to fund through the program. This is most effective when used with other strategies and tailored to local context. We specifically ask for how the CCTV is complementing other crime prevention activities. There's a significant range of issues for councils to consider in, uh, with the CCTV project. They include privacy, looking at technical considerations such as how it's going to be powered and, and network infrastructure. For example, if you're going to look at uh, cable or wireless, how you're going to seek approval from various sources. We know that that's been a key impediment for a number of projects in terms of the time that it's taken to get approval for the placement of cameras um, in particular locations on, on businesses, approval issues with power companies. How the, the footage will be monitored, so whether you're looking at it being retrospectively, passively or actively monitored, such as how Geelong and Shepparton Council actually pay for additional monitoring on Friday and Saturday nights. Clearly there's substantial additional costs there that councils need to consider. A letter of support is mandatory for CCTV applications. And so that's both in terms of the, the need for the project and whether the, the solution is appropriate, and also where Victoria Police have a role in monitoring that footage, confirming that role. 
There's a number of resources on our website that I would refer people to again on CCTV. We've got our guide to CCTV in public places, which steps through many of the key considerations in more detail that, uh, for councils and your key things that you'd need to be putting in place around consultation and um, really adequately scoping the project. There's a privacy information sheet, ombudsman's guidelines. We also have a number of presentations from previous forums. We're not presenting today on any CCTV projects. We've had that in previous forums. So Shepparton Council presented at a, at a previous forum. Amanda Collins from Ballarat, who presented at a forum, their presentations are, uh, are available and I'd encourage people to look at those. There was also a presentation from the Privacy Commissioner, stepping through privacy issues that councils need to consider, and a presentation from a CCTV technical expert that went into you know, more of those uh, details around network infrastructure and things that practical logistical issues that councils should consider. Ultimately, we want to support good projects that make a difference in local communities. The assessment criteria in the guidelines aims to support a problem-solving approach. An essential part of that, of course, is understanding the problem that you're trying to solve. Context is really important here because no two communities are the same. We ask people to also convey the impact of the problem and who is impacted. When we look at evidence, we recognise that this can come in a number of forms including safety audits, community consultation reports, uh, council maintenance records. We also have the Crime Statistics Agency and Victoria Police here today to talk about what they can provide and can't provide in terms of information. We don't weight one form of evidence higher than the others, so I know that issue has come up in the past in terms of crime data, that, that those that have that will be weighted more strongly. As I mentioned, we recognise that that can come in a number of different forms. I'd encourage councils, though, to consider a safety audit, which may be in conjunction with Victoria Police. And that would be looking at a holistic assessment of the site in question. One of the learnings that we've seen uh, a number of times from councils in their evaluation reports is that they point to the fact that they wish that they'd done a, a more comprehensive safety audit at the beginning. There would have been things that they, they would have picked up on at that point and potential interventions that they could have included if they'd, if they'd looked at it more comprehensively. So that's coming direct from other councils as, as a learning and um, certainly want to share that with people. Photos can also be a very uh, useful while illustrating the problem and telling the story and can be useful if you're successful in then being able to show those before and after photos tell that story often more powerfully than you can uh, in words. Now, the link between a well-understood problem and the proposed solution is a really important part of the application. Applications should make it very clear why the chosen approach is likely to be effective. So what is the, the rationale for the project? Maybe that you're aware from other interventions you've, you've tried before or from what you've heard from other councils that, that um, particular measures have worked well or not worked so well. This is also your opportunity to apply principles such as the safety design guidelines or any other research or crime prevention theory that you're aware of. As Professor Nick Tilley, who's a leading crime prevention expert, states, there's many ways to prevent crime, but most are not unconditional. The same intervention can have negative effects in, in, in one area, whereas it might have positive in another. And sometimes simple but imaginative solutions can make an impact where other more expensive uh, efforts have failed. Now, the best applications after evidence in the, the issue have provided clear, measurable and action-oriented objectives. This has included some short and longer-term outcomes. We should be able to understand what will be completed and what are the, the key benefits of the project. Illustrating the scope through maps and designs can be very helpful because we can clearly see what you're proposing to do, where you're proposing to do it, where, if you're looking at lights or CCTV or something like that, where those, those will be in the, in the area in question. We ask that organisations identify basic measures of success in their application and, and that they're committed to evaluation. We're not asking for an evaluation plan in your, in your uh, application. 
if projects are successful within three months of you being um, approved, an evaluation plan you know, would be required. And there's an expectation that a, uh, an evaluation report happens 12 months after the project is finished as well to, to look at the impact of the, the measures in place. We're also looking at engaging an external evaluator to do a more detailed evaluation in a sample of sites and we ask that councils cooperate with that, that process. Now we know that consultation and engagement is critical to support good decision making, helping to get different views to understand the problem and building in ownership within the community to support longer term outcomes. At our last forum in late 2013, Marjan Hajara from Moorland Council talked about her project in Glenroy and the process of working with the, the community. And she put it well when she talked about changing it from the place of others to the place of us. Physical changes in and of themselves are not enough to, to be able to do that. Good engagement is needed in creating inclusive public spaces, considering some of the specific issues that women, young people, culturally diverse groups have in relation to public space, how they use it and why they don't use it. For the application, being able to see what engagement has taken place and what is proposed helps us to make an assessment of project readiness, but also to see how the community has been taken along with the process. As we've signalled in the guidelines, we're very interested in those proposals where councils have a commitment to support future activity within that new uh, or upgraded space. One of the, the key success factors that we've seen with projects has been collaboration within council and across business units. That can be within the, the proposal itself, um, but also in the implementation of the project. The reason we like to see that, that is through our evaluations, we've also seen that that has helped a community safety lens being applied to other capital projects delivered by council. That opportunity of community safety officers working with urban design engineering has then had some longer term benefits. And so that's a particular thing that we, we would definitely like to encourage. Now, the best applications have also demonstrated a strong implementation approach. The grants process is a competitive one, and we expect that projects deliver in line with what they're proposing in their application. Like councils, we also have expectations in relation to spending uh, money and <laughs> delivering within certain timeframes. We've had instances where projects haven't been planned so well, and then we're only being advised at the death that you know, half of the project can't be delivered. Um, and then that leaves us in a very awkward position, whereas we would have been able to, to have allocated that money to another council for another project and, and delivered some community benefits. So in relation to your project plan, it's really just thinking through those key steps, um, thinking through the, the key roles of different staff, you know, looking, thinking about your procurement um, process that you're going to take, uh, you know, whether you're looking at doing a design and construct tender or separating out those processes, but thinking through those and having some contingencies uh, in place and you know, allowing some buffer time. Again, it comes back to those projects that you're putting forward that really can be delivered within an 18-month time frame, but also allowing enough time for you know, uh, you know, some good engagement uh, and consultation around the design components that you're proposing. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, we have a range of resources on our, on our website. We will be looking at putting these presentations, uh, you know, the videos of these presentations up within a fortnight. The PowerPoint's probably by uh, uh, early next week. We have some frequently asked questions and featured projects on a sampler projects. Some of those are in a bit more you know, detail and tell more of the project story than others. The Safer Design Guidelines is a really necessary document for people to look at. Um, there's those CCTV documents that I uh, referred to. There's also a Australian Institute of Criminology report on effective crime prevention interventions for implementation by local government that's particularly you know, relevant as well and that I'd encourage people to have a look at. Now, just in summing up, the, the program closes four o'clock um, on the 21st of August. So we've allowed around three months for the application process. We won't accept late applications. We make that very clear. We have given that three months. Um, and I'd encourage people to put in as early as possible. We have had a trend of people 
putting in the last afternoon, sometimes in the last 30 seconds that it's available. And, um, and you'd be surprised how many of them are like that. Um, I can't speak, I was someone who left my essays and things to the last moment, but um, that wasn't for $250,000 as well. So very much encourage people to put it in as early as possible. Inquiries can be sent to the, uh, the email there or by ringing our grants information line. So if you have any particular questions, if there's things, say, around the, the co-contributions, you're unclear around in terms of whether you meet that, send us an email and we can clarify that, that very easily. After the applications close, uh, how long would a decision, do you think, take to uh, be known? Uh, well, we say, uh, you know, within three months, depending on the number of applications, past rounds we've probably looked at about two months. So it's between two to three months. What was the quantum of the, this grant round? For this particular grant round, we're looking at about 2.5 million being available. Thanks.